Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Hat Historian. In this video, I will be talking about a hat that is emblematic of the military sartorial excesses of the Napoleonic era, the Shako. The Shako is a tall, cylindrical hat, usually made of hardened felt or leather, with a small visor adorned with a variety of regimental plates, cords, chin scales, plumes, and whatever else might appeal to the issuing authority. Its name comes from the Hungarian Ksako, meaning peak or horn, referring to the small visor at the front. Originally inspired by Balkan shepherd's hats, it quickly spread throughout European militaries at the beginning of the 19th century, replacing the previous tricorns, and from there it was introduced to all the militaries that took inspiration from them. While long ago abandoned on the field for its lack of practicality, it remains part of dress uniforms of many armed forces, and has spread to other military-inspired outfits, most notably that of school marching bands. So let's see where this peculiar military headdress comes from. The term shako comes from the Hungarian, and please excuse the pronunciation, ksako suveg, meaning peaked cap. The hat has its origins in the army of the Austrian Empire in the 1760s, which at the time covered most of Central Europe, including Hungary and some of the Balkans. At that time, it had started to replace the cocked hats which I have talked about before, which were common throughout European armies, with different taller types of hats, which commanders felt would be better suited to close rank combat, even if they didn't protect the wearer from the elements as well. While many infantry units experimented with the casquette, a skullcap with a decorative plaque in the front, units on the border of Austria's longtime enemy, the Ottoman Empire, went a different way. These Grenzinfanterie, or border units, stationed in the Hungarian portion of the empire, were often recruited from the Balkans, many of them Serbs. Part of their national costume included tall cylindrical caps, which they adapted into their military uniform to represent their origin. When not used on the border, these experienced troops were regularly deployed in other areas of conflict, and their distinctive uniforms became a common sight on European battlefields. The style was soon adopted by the Hussar regiments, a kind of light cavalry with a fierce reputation of combat prowess and rowdiness. This reputation made other countries, like the German states, France, or Britain, create Hussar regiments of their own whose uniforms were modeled on the Hungarian style, and whose own reputations popularized the look throughout Europe, including tall hats called busbies or mirlitons. Meanwhile, back in the Austrian Empire, the border troop regiments started adding small leather visors to their tall hats in the 1780s, as a practical matter in order to shield their eyes from the sun, or prevent rainwater from falling into them. From this, the shako as it came to be recognized was created. Over the next two and a half decades, this hat would go from being an interesting regional Hungarian unit hat to become the most common military headgear of the Western world. While within the Austrian army it remained contained to the Grenzer units, it was quickly adopted by neighboring Germanic states in the 1790s. In 1797, a version with a large flat front on which a regimental badge was attached was adopted by the Portuguese marines, which they called the Baretina. Around that time, it was also adopted by French light infantry units, who had encountered it in their battles against the Austrian in the wars following the French Revolution. It truly began to gain prominence in 1801, when it was issued as the standard headgear for the regular British army. The British had used German Jaeger units as hired skirmishers in the late 18th century, and these men often wore shakos from their homelands. In 1800, the British commander-in-chief, Frederick, Duke of York, wanted to reform the outfits and equipment of the British troops. Among these changes, he introduced the stovepipe shako, so-called because of its resemblance to the item, a relatively simple cylindrical version of the hat. A little later, in 1806, the French army adopted a much more ornate shako for their general line infantry in an inverted cone shape with a wider top, festooned with cords, plumes, and plaques, similar to the one I'm wearing now. Inspired by these two European powers, other countries such as the remaining German states, Sweden, Spain, and Russia soon created versions of their own. So one might ask, why would armies issue their soldiers such tall, cumbersome, and conspicuous hats? Well, late 18th and early 19th century linear warfare tactics were vastly different from what we now know, and some of the decisions they made, which might seem absurd today, made sense to the people of the time. Soldiers fought with smoothbore muskets which, well, powerful and simple to use, took time to reload, with an experienced soldier averaging three shots a minute, and were much less accurate than modern rifles. The black powder also created a lot of smoke which obscured battlefields. Therefore, concealment was not really a concern, and troops were formed into large lines of fire to maximize chances of hitting their target. That's why it was not a problem that British troops wore bright red, or French troops a large white front to combat, as it helped commanders on nearby hills identify their troops more easily. 
In this context, the shako helped the men look much taller and more imposing to their opponents, a psychological warfare factor that could help intimidate the enemy. Some said they also helped protect from saber blows, though while there might have been anecdotal evidence that this happened, it was not the purpose of the design. States also had a great sense of pride in their military, and felt that the more ornate and colorful the uniform, and the more up-to-date its fashion, the more powerful they would appear. Therefore, Napoleonic-era armies were sent to combat in highly decorated outfits in a show of wealth and power of their country. As the wars went on, the French army realized that some of this decoration was excessive, and simplified their shakos slightly in 1810, removing the cords, braids, and plumes, and, and replacing them with simpler cockades, bands, and pom-poms. However, they were the exception to this simplification. The British, feeling their relatively drab stovepipe shakos was unbefitting of their powerful status, replaced it with what they called the Belgic Chaco, which was inspired by the Portuguese Baratina I mentioned earlier. It was sometimes nicknamed the Tombstone, because its large front insignia, and was not widely used until Waterloo, where it became famous. Around 1812, the Russians also adopted the Kiver, a more ornate and wider version of the Chaco, and across the Atlantic the US Army began issuing a leather Chaco to its troops. Bowing to the general influence, even the originator of the Austrian Empire issued it army-wide, having until then restricted it to the original border units. In 1815, the closing of the Napoleonic Wars and the coming of an era of relative peace ushered in possibly the most extravagant period for the military shako. Sweden had adopted a highly bell-shaped shako that became widespread as the decade went on. The British Regency shako featured a large top and plumes that brought the overall height of the headdress to almost two feet. The French kept their Napoleonic shakos, simply replacing the insignias with the newly restored monarchies. In the New World, the newly independent South American nations mostly kept the military styles of their former rulers, out of tradition, and in an attempt to legitimize themselves on the world stage. In a notable example, the Mexican army wore elaborate Napoleonic-style shakos in the famous Battle of the Alamo. This trend of increasingly large, ornate, and frankly impractical shakos continued through the 1820s, but then new conflicts brought the commanders back to the reality of the battlefield rather than the elegance of the parade ground. The French army, which had, as I mentioned in the video on the kepi, worn their large shakos to invade Algeria, started replacing them with more practical caps in the field. Similarly, the British reduced the size of their shakos after they proved highly impractical in India. Shakos began shrinking, and started becoming narrower on the top rather than wider. During the Crimean War, a version of the shako called the Albert, after Victoria's husband who had designed it, was issued, featuring a visor both in front and in back to protect the neck. But this proved highly unpopular and was soon discarded. Some countries, notably Russia and especially Prussia, discarded the shako entirely in favor of spiked helmets, which I have talked about in another video. The French, while retaining the shako officially for full dress, replaced it with the kepi for general wear, and then discarded it completely by the end of the century. With warfare becoming more precise and weaponry more accurate, the large shako was too impractical for use on the battlefield. Yet it continued in some form in many armies, usually as a dress item, often much smaller than the original Napoleonic versions, resembling more of an ornate kepi. Such countries were the Austrians, as seen on some pictures of Prince Franz Ferdinand, but also Belgian infantry, German Jaeger units who had a very distinctive shape version, Danish hussars, Russian officers, and several other Asians, who all wore them in some form until the eve of World War I. This brutal industrial conflict, however, dealt the death blow to the shako, as well as most other remnants of the ornamented uniforms of old. Indeed, several of the regimes that had fielded it, notably Russia and Austria-Hungary, were overthrown, and the new governments wanted to eliminate these symbols of the old monarchies. One of the few versions that remained as a standard headdress was the German Jaeger version, which was used as the hat of the West German police until the 1970s. While greatly outdated as a practical headdress, the shako has not completely disappeared and remains in use in full dress uniforms in many nations. The smaller, shorter variant is used amongst others by the French Republican Guard, the Spanish Royal Guard, the Danish Guard Hussars, and the cadets of several military academies from France, Portugal, or Italy. The medium truncated cone version is used by the Canadian Voltigeurs de Québec, and the full tall version is used in ceremonial guard units of Russia, Indonesia, as well as many nations of South America, notably Brazil or Argentina. It is also worn by cadets of several American military academies, most famously West Point. Outside these military fields, it is also used as the headdress of many American and Filipino marching bands, as they originally took their inspiration from army bands, who often played in full dress. Finally, it is usually seen on the head of the title character of Tchaikovsky's famous ballet The Nutcracker, as he is usually depicted in an old soldier's uniform. Symbol of the excesses and impracticality of Napoleonic military dress, the shako is nonetheless a striking piece of military headgear, and its distinctive appearance, along with the height and allure it gives the wearer, 
makes it still popular as a dress item for armies around the world. So I hope once again you found this video interesting and will join me again soon for another hat. Until then, I tip my hat to you.